Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy Chapter 19 In general the cows were milked as they presented themselves, without fancy or choice. But certain cows will show a fondness for a particular pair of hands, sometimes carrying this predilection so far as to refuse to stand at all except to their favourite, the pail of a stranger being unceremoniously kicked over. It was Dairyman Crick's rule to insist on breaking down these partialities and aversions by constant interchange, since otherwise, in the event of a milkman or maid going away from the dairy, he was placed in a difficulty. The maid's private aims, however, were the reverse of the dairyman's rule. The daily selection by each damsel of the eight or ten cows to which she had grown accustomed, rendering the operation on their willing udders surprisingly easy and effortless. Tess, like her compeers, soon discovered which of the cows had a preference for her style of manipulation and her fingers having become delicate from the long domiciliary imprisonments to which she had subjected herself at intervals during the last two or three years, she would have been glad to meet the milcher's views in this respect. Out of the whole ninety-five there were eight in particular—Dumpling, Fancy, Lofty, Mist, Old Pretty, Young Pretty, Tidy and Loud who, though the teats of one or two were as hard as carrots, gave down to her with a readiness that made her work on them a mere touch of the fingers. Knowing, however, the dairyman's wish, she endeavoured conscientiously to take the animals just as they came, excepting the very hard yielders, which she could not yet manage. But she soon found a curious correspondence between the ostensibly chance position of the cows and her wishes in this matter, till she felt that their order could not be the result of accident. The dairyman's pupil had lent a hand in getting some of the cows together of late, and at the fifth or sixth time she turned her eyes, as she rested against the cow, full of sly inquiry upon him. "'Mr. Clare, you have ranged the cows,' she said, blushing and in making the accusation symptoms of a smile gently lifted her upper lip in spite of her, so as to show the tips of her teeth, the lower lip remaining severely still. "'Well, it makes no difference,' said he. "'You will always be here to milk them.' "'Do you think so? I hope I shall, but I don't know.' She was angry with herself afterwards, thinking that he— unaware of her grave reasons for liking this seclusion, might have mistaken her meaning. She had spoken so earnestly to him, as if his presence were somehow a factor in her wish. Her misgiving was such that at dawn, when the milking was over, she walked in the garden alone to continue her regrets that she had disclosed to him her discovery of his considerateness. It was a typical summer evening in June, the atmosphere being in such delicate equilibrium and so transmissive that inanimate objects seemed endowed with two or three senses, if not five. There was no distinction between the near and the far, and an auditor felt close to everything within the horizon. The soundlessness impressed her as a positive entity, rather than as the mere negation of noise. It was broken by the strumming of strings. Tess had heard those notes in the attic above her head. Dim, flattened, constrained by their confinement, they had never appealed to her as now, when they wandered in the still air, with a stark quality like that of nudity. To speak absolutely, both instrument and execution were poor, but the relative is all and as she listened, Tess, like a fascinated bird, could not leave the spot. Far from leaving, she drew up towards the performer, keeping behind the hedge that he might not guess her presence. The outskirt of the garden in which Tess found herself had been left uncultivated for some years, and was now damp and rank, with juicy grass which sent up mists of pollen at a touch and with tall, blooming weeds emitting offensive smells—weeds whose red and yellow and purple hues 
formed a polychrome as dazzling as that of cultivated flowers. She went stealthily as a cat through this profusion of growth, gathering cuckoo-spittle on her skirts, cracking snails that were underfoot, staining her hands with thistle-milk and slug-slime, and rubbing off upon her naked arms sticky blights which, though snow-white on the apple-tree trunks, made madder stains on her skin. Thus she drew quite near to Clare, still unobserved of him. Tess was conscious of neither time nor space. The exultation which she had described as being productible at will by gazing at a star came now without any determination of hers. She undulated upon the thin notes of the second-hand harp, and their harmonies passed like breezes through her, bringing tears into her eyes. The floating pollen seemed to be his notes made visible, and the dampness of the garden the weeping of the garden's sensibility. Though near nightfall, the rank-smelling weed-flowers glowed as if they would not close for intentness, and the waves of colour mixed with the waves of sound. The light, which still shone, was derived mainly from a large hole in the western bank of cloud. It was like a piece of day left behind by accident, dusk having closed in elsewhere. He concluded his plaintive melody, a very simple performance, demanding no great skill, and she waited, thinking another might be begun. But, tired of playing, he had desultorily come round the fence, and was rambling up behind her. Tess, her cheeks on fire, moved away furtively, as if hardly moving at all. Angel, however, saw her light summer gown, and he spoke, his low tones reaching her, though he was some distance off. "'What makes you draw off in that way, Tess?' said he. "'Are you afraid?' "'Oh, no, sir, not of outdoor things, especially just now when the apple bluff is fallen, and everything so green.' "'But you have your indoor fears, eh?' "'Well, yes, sir.' What of? I couldn't quite say. The milk turning sour? No. Life in general? Yes, sir. Ah, so have I, very often. This hobble of being alive is rather serious, don't you think so? It is, now you put it that way. All the same, I shouldn't have expected a young girl like you to see it so just yet. How is it you do?" She maintained a hesitating silence. "'Come, Tess, tell me in confidence.' She thought that he meant what were the aspects of things to her, and replied shyly, "'The trees have inquisitive eyes, haven't they? That is, seems as if they had. And the river says, "'Why do ye trouble me with your looks? And you see to see numbers of to-morrows, just all in a line, the first of them the biggest and clearest, the others getting smaller and smaller as they stand further away. But they all seem very fierce and cruel, and as if they said, I am coming, beware of me, beware of me, and you, sir, can raise up dreams with your music, and drive all such horrid fancies away. He was surprised to find this young woman, who, though but a milkmaid, had just that touch of rarity about her which might make her the envied of her housemates, shaping such sad imagings. She was expressing in her own native phrases, assisted a little by her sixth standard training, feelings which might almost have been called those of the age, the ache of modernism. The perception arrested him less when he reflected that what are called advanced ideas are really in great part but the latest fashion in definition. A more accurate expression, by words in logi and ism, of sensations which men and women have vaguely grasped for centuries. Still, it was strange that they should have come to her while yet so young. More than strange, it was impressive, interesting, pathetic. Not getting the cause. 
there was nothing to remind him that experience is as to intensity, and not as to duration. Tess's passing corporeal blight had been her mental harvest. Tess, on her part, could not understand why a man of clerical family and good education, and above physical want, should look upon it as a mishap to be alive. For the unhappy pilgrim herself there was very good reason. But how could this admirable and poetic man ever have descended into the valley of humiliation, have felt with the man of Uz, as she had herself felt two or three years ago, my soul chooseth strangling and death, rather than my life. I loathe it. I would not live all way. It was true that he was at present out of his class. But she knew that was only because, like Peter the Great in a shipwright's yard, he was studying what he wanted to know. He did not milk cows because he was obliged to milk cows, but because he was learning how to be a rich and prosperous dairyman, landowner, agriculturalist, and breeder of cattle. He would become an American or Australian Abraham, commanding like a monarch his flocks and his herds, his spotted and ring-straked, his man-servants and his maids. At times, nevertheless, it did seem unaccountable to her that a decidedly bookish, musical, thinking young man should have chosen deliberately to be a farmer and not a clergyman, like his father and brothers. Thus, neither having the clue to the other's secret, they were respectively puzzled at what each revealed, and awaited new knowledge of each other's character and moods, without attempting to pry into each other's history. Every day, every hour, brought to him one more little stroke of her nature, and to her one more of his. Tess was trying to lead a repressed life, but she little divined the strength of her own vitality. At first Tess seemed to regard Angel Clare as an intelligence rather than as a man. As such she compared him to herself, and at every discovery of the abundance of his illuminations, of the distance between her own modest mental standpoint and the unmeasurable Andean altitude of his, she became quite dejected, disheartened from all further effort on her own part whatever. He observed her dejection one day, when he had casually mentioned something to her about pastoral life in ancient Greece. She was gathering the buds called Lords and Ladies from the bank while he spoke. "'Why do you look so woebegone all of a sudden?' he asked. "'Oh, tis only about my own self,' she said, with a frail laugh of sadness, fitfully beginning to peel a lady meanwhile. "'Just a sense of what might have been with me. My life looks as if it had been wasted for want of chances. When I see what you know, what you have read and seen and thought, I feel what a nothing I am. I'm like the poor Queen of Sheba who lived in the Bible. There is no more spirit in me. Bless my soul! Don't go troubling about that. Why, he said with some enthusiasm, I should be only too glad, my dear Tess, to help you to anything in the way of history, or any line of reading you would like to take up. It is a lady again interrupted she, holding out the bud she had peeled. "'What? I mean that there are always more ladies than lords when you come to peel them. Never mind about the lords and ladies. Would you like to take up any course of study, history, for example? Sometimes I feel I don't want to know anything more about it than I know already.' "'Why not?' "'Because what's the use of learning that I am one of a long row only, finding out that there is set down in some old book someone just like me, and to know that I shall only act her part, making me sad, that's all. The best is not to remember that your nature and your past doings have been just like thousands and thousands, and that your coming life and doings will be like thousands and thousands. What? Really, then, you don't want to learn anything? 
I shouldn't mind learning why the sun do shine on the just and the unjust alike, she answered, with a slight quaver in her voice. But that's what books will not tell me. Tess, fire for such bitterness! Of course, he spoke with a conversational sense of duty only, for that sort of wandering had not been unknown to himself in bygone days. And as he looked at the unpractised mouth and lips, he thought that such a daughter of the soil could only have caught up the sentiment by rote. She went on peeling the lords and ladies, till Clare, regarding for a moment the wave-like curl of her lashes as they drooped with her bent gaze on her soft cheek, lingeringly went away. When he was gone she stood a while, thoughtfully peeling the last bud, and then, awakening from her reverie, flung it and all the crowd of florid nobility impatiently on the ground, in an ebullition of displeasure with herself for her niceries, and with a quickening warmth in her heart of hearts. How stupid he must think her! In an access of hunger for his good opinion she bethought herself of what she had latterly endeavoured to forget, so unpleasant had been its issues, the identity of her family with that of the knightly d'Urbervilles. Barren attribute as it was, disastrous as its discovery had been in many ways to her, perhaps Mr. Clare, as a gentleman and a student of history, would respect her sufficiently to forget her childish conduct with the lords and ladies, if he knew that those Purbeck marble and alabaster people in Kingsmere Church really represented her own lineal forefathers, that she was no spurious d'Urberville, compounded of money and ambition like those at Trantridge, but true d'Urberville to the bone. But before venturing to make the revelation, dubious Tess indirectly sounded the dairyman as to its possible effect upon Mr. Clare, by asking the former if Mr. Clare had any great respect for old county families, when they had lost all their money and land. "'Mr. Clare,' said the dairyman emphatically, "'is one of the most rebellist rosoms you ever knowed. Not a bit like the rest of his family. And if there's one thing that he do hate more than another, tis the notion of what's called a old family. He says that it stands to reason that old families have done their spurt o' work in past days, and can't have anything left in em now. There's the Billets, and the Drenkards, and the Greys, and the St. Quentins, and the Hardys, and the Goulds, who used to own the lands for miles down this valley. You could buy em all up now for a song a most. Why, our little Retty Priddle here, you know, is one of the Paradells, the old family that used to own lots of the land out by King's Hittock, now owned by the Earl of Wessex, afore even he or his was heard of. Well, Mr. Clare found this out, and spoke quite scornful to the poor girl for days. Ah, he says to her, you'll never make a good dairy maid. All your skill was used up ages ago in Palestine, and you must lie fallow for a thousand years to get strength for more deeds. A boy came here t'other day asking for a job, and said his name was Matt, and when we asked him his surname, he said he'd never heard that I had any surname, and when we asked why, he said he supposed his folks hadn't been established long enough. "'Ah, you're the very boy I want,' said Mr. Clare, jumping up and shaking hands with him. "'I've great hopes of you,' and gave him half a crown. "'Oh, no, he can't stomach old families.' After hearing this caricature of Clare's opinions, poor Tess was glad that she had not said a word in a weak moment about her family— even though it was so unusually old as almost to have gone round the circle and become a new one. Besides, another dairy girl was as good as she, it seemed, in that respect. She held her tongue about the d'Urberville vault, and the knight of the conqueror whose name she bore. The insight afforded into Clare's character suggested to her 
that it was largely owing to her supposed untraditional newness that she had won interest in his eyes. End of chapter 19